there are issues with gluten and soy and for for individuals who are sensitive to with leaky gut syndrome and so forth, well, right? But, yeah, but that's all true if you have leaky gut syndrome. But what causes leaky gut? Inflammation. Mm -hmm. All roads lead back there. So again, a lot of these problems we'd see, once you basically heal the gut, basically make the, the, the uh, endothelial junctions more uh, much more tighter, all of a sudden they tend to basically dissipate. So it's not that gluten causes inflammation, mm -hmm. but a leaky gut is an, a sure way of making a lot of things that should not be in the bloodstream will get in the bloodstream, like uh, you know toxins and uh, others from bacterial toxins. We have 100 trillion bacteria sitting in our gut waiting for the opportunity to get into the holy, basically the holy grail, our bloodstream. It's the integrity of our gut that protects us. Men and women, as they age, there's an inevitable decline in most of the hormones. Would you say that the decline in, in testosterone uh, associated with andropause and with women, are there situations where you mentioned that hormones, which are hundreds of times more potent, can play a role in, in helping people to manage their age? Oh, well, I think they can, but I think before we basically look, one looks at hormone replacement, look at hormonal modulation by the diet. Uh, let's use estrogen as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as estrogen levels drop, insulin levels increase. So I say, okay, before I start adding extra estrogen supplements, I'm gonna really work hard to decrease the levels of insulin. What's my drug of choice there? Food. Uh, the thing is testosterone, uh, saying yes, as we age, uh, yes, our testosterone levels drop, but we have another hormone, it's called growth hormone. It turns out the levels of growth hormone in the pituitary are still high, just more difficult to release. So we have to work harder, like doing things like exercise. And so that you know, they say, oh, come on, I, 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 I don't want to hear it. I, I, there's, they say, you can take, there's an easier way, but it's a more tricky way. And if you aren't basically following a good anti-inflammatory lifestyle, diet, exercise, stress reduction, then you're playing a dangerous game with hormonal supplementation. If you are following that, then hormonal supplementation can be used at lower dosages to get the same effects. For young children, uh, the highest incidence of obesity ages zero to four. Right. What can we do to uh, alter that, that potential? Is there certain supplements, certain things we can do to enhance the child's diet? Uh, where is this coming from? Well, it's coming from basically, uh, it's coming from fetal programming. The, the, the diet of the mother basically can will have a tremendous impact on turning on uh, various genes in the fetus. Mm -hmm. If the mother has hyperinsulinemia, the fetus will expose <coughs> that and basically say, that's what the world's waiting for me. But again, that, um, uh, and likewise, inflammation. If the mother is inflamed, those inflammatory mediators can pass the placenta and affect now the development of the fetus. So uh, when we talk about children's health, it really starts at minus nine months. Now, if we already have a child that's born and uh, we're starting to see abnormalities, say, we just have to work harder. We have to work harder and have a little tough love. That's why your grandmother said you can't leave the table until you eat their vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, the kid throws a tantrum, that's fine. The same, when you're ready to eat the vegetables, let me know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we have lost the will to basically exert a little effort on terms of, you know, saying, having the knowledge of what to do and why and basically what, is, what will be the consequences if we don't. Dr. Sears, uh, in the South Pacific, people eat a lot of coconut meat and the water. Clearly, it's considered a saturated fat, but it's different. It's high in fiber, it's unprocessed. Is, is there something that you feel that, uh, that the longevity of the South Pacific is reminiscent of? They don't seem to have oxidized uh, LDL cholesterol. I mean, what, what is going on with the South, South Pacific? And do you accept uh, eating coconut meat? Well, I'd like to really focus on uh, the data points we have more valid data on in terms of longevity. That's why the Okinawans mm -hmm. are a great indication. The average Okinawan of the elderly Okinawans, they will eat about a kilogram, two pounds of vegetables per day. Two they, pounds, uh, very good. Exactly. <laughs> uh, they are the largest fish consumers. They, they basically eat twice the amount of fish as a Japanese. But the Okinawans, I, I read one peer review, they were saying they eat fish only a couple times a month. Uh, is there some no. question about that? Yes. Uh, okay. They, 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 because it's, remember, it's a volcanic island. They can't grow rice. And so that rice is a very small part of their diet. Actually, a bigger part of their diet is pork. 
So pork and fish are their primary protein sources and lots of vegetables. But they do eat a lot of purple sweet potatoes and oranges. Yes, and from that standpoint, those have now more resistant starch. They're less likely to be absorbed. But the purple is saying one thing, it means it has polyphenols. Ah. And the other thing, they restrict their calories. And by restricting- Hari hashibu, they eat up to 80% of when they're satisfied. Uh, yeah, and by doing so, you're now activating the gene SIRT1 that makes more of the uh, master metabolic switch, AMP kinase. Now, say, but I don't want to eat two pounds of vegetables. Well, <laughs> okay, it's, it's hard, but it can be done. Uh, mm -hmm. But those two pounds of vegetables or the, uh, the, the purple um, uh, you know, you know, potatoes, it's the polyphenols can activate the same gene to turn on the enzyme of life. So again, uh, we basically we had to you know, learn from the past, not to live in it. If it's difficult to eat two pounds of vegetables, say, I can understand that, though it's not that hard. Uh, but uh, the <coughs> fact is, we say, okay, but I need to have adequate levels of polyphenols. Where do most Americans get their polyphenols today? Coffee. Oh, really? It's a, it's a pathetic aspect. But of course, the state of our healthcare system is just as pathetic. Sure. And again, two generations ago, average intake of um, omega-3 fatty acids because every mother gave their child cod liver oil was about 2,500 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids on a daily basis. Was it a day? 125 milligrams, a 95% reduction. So Dr. Barry Sears, if, if you're looking at insulin, which is such an important hormone, particularly with this epidemic of obesity, uh, there were some early studies by Dr. Felber who they infused oil uh, as an IV. They measured the change in glucose and insulin response. Dr. Anderson who fed people potatoes and rice and then, and then on, with no added oils, they measured their um, insulin resistance or glucose tolerance test. Um, and uh, Dr. Kelly M. West uh, also had uh, followed down that pathway. Is there something else that influences insulin? Could it be that some process fats might have a, an impact on insulin um, resistance and or the ability to have insulin push the glucose into the cells. Isn't that the most important yes. function of insulin? And, and, what, and that's what we call insulin resistance. Okay. And what causes insulin resistance? This is a fluffball question for you. Inflation. Inflation. <laughs> and uh, because it was you know, interesting that, you know, the first proven drug to uh, basically reverse completely type 2 diabetes was shown in 1876, salicylic acid, and, if you, but, uh, and reproduced over and over again in the, the 20th century. High doses of aspirin could basically reverse type 2 diabetes. Now, they were high doses, about 7 to 8 grams per day. Mm. Most people would probably bleed on that level. But if you could tolerate it, your diabetes was gone. Uh, our newest breakthrough drugs in terms of um, treating diabetes, basically anti-inflammatory drugs. Again, the way to treat insulin resistance is to decrease inflammation in the fat cell, in the liver, in the muscle. Dr. Sears, lately a lot of people are talking about using coconut oil. Tell us about your concerns and or your reflections. Well, I, coconut oil has gotten a lot of attention recently uh, as a, a miracle oil. But uh, there are some good points about coconut oil and there are some bad ones. Let's talk about the good ones first. One, it's an oil that's virtually devoid of omega-6 fatty acids. That's one way of reducing inflammation. So from that standpoint, excellent characteristics. Two, it's rich in a certain source of um, you know, vitamin E known as tocotrienols. And it has, tocotrienols has some very, very interesting uh, properties as antioxidants. So we have two strong pluses. Now for the downside. Uh, a coconut oil is virtually all saturated fat and the sugar chain saturated fats that can interact with uh, certain uh, components in the cell called toll-like receptors, particularly toll-like receptor 4. This can cause some inflammation. Next thing about the coconut oil, it contains medium chain triglycerides that enter the body through a different pathway. They go through the portal vein, directly to the liver, and now basically they help uh, our burn there, but in the process, you're using up a lot of the stored glycogen, which is re your reserve to maintain blood sugar levels. So, considering the pluses and negatives of coconut uh, oil, I give it a B minus. Okay. Now, let's take another another oil that was used many years ago, lard. I actually give lard a, a B to B plus. 
Uh, it too is very, very low in omega-6 fatty acids. Not as low as coconut oil, but low. Uh, about half the fatty acids of lard are monounsaturated fats. But the other fatty acids, though they're saturated fats, are primarily stearic acid. Stearic acid is unique among saturated fats because it's converted rapidly in the body to oleic acid. So from that standpoint, uh, you know, the um, of lard is, I give that at least a B. Now, let's go to the A's. I'd give it basically uh, now uh, avocado, great source of polyphenols, it's colored. And high in fiber. And high in fiber, uh, but even the oil is high you know, in uh, polyphenols and rich in omega, uh, you know, monosatur monosaturated fats and low in omega-3. And of course, extra virgin olive oil. It's not the olive oil, it's the polyphenols in the extra virgin olive oil that give all its health benefits. And, and olives themselves, whether they be black or green? Olives are great, you know, yeah. but they're very bitter. The bitterness is the polyphenols. Ah. And that's why basically, how can you tell if you have good extra virgin olive oil? You put some olive oil on the tip of your tongue, should taste like butter. Now flip it with your tongue to the back of the throat, you should start coughing. That's the polyphenols. Mm -hmm. By that criteria, 99% of extra virgin olive oil in America is adulterated. Adulterated by man? I mean, by man, have, you know, where there's money to be made, there's adulteration. Because they wanted to remove the thing that people wouldn't tolerate. Well, you just, you just dilute the it taste. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and that's why when you have, you know, what is sold as extra virgin olive oil would not pass in Italy uh, even close to it. Hmm. And coconut meat, it's high fiber content. It's high fiber. What, what, what would you rate it? Uh, uh, coconut meat is not very high in protein, but it's it basically as a fiber content, it's good. Okay. So I'd give it, you know, again, uh, high marks in that because the fiber is not digestible, but the right fiber can basically now be acted upon by the, 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 the uh, bacteria in the gut to basically make a short chain fatty acids, butyric acid, that basically has some great benefits in helping to control glycemic levels. So that won't harm insulin levels. In fact, it may assist and improve exactly. insulin right. levels. So again, coconut meat as part of an overall dietary program with lots of color on there, because last time I looked, coconut meat didn't have too many polyphenols. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, the same. So when they're pink, that's uh, including some, or there seems to be different colors. The, the, what, what are you referring to on yeah, the coconut? Well, well, here's a good rule of thumb. The more white you put on your plate, the more inflammation you create. Mm -hmm. White bread, white rice, white pasta, white potatoes. These are all very powerful in, you know, uh, inflammation during entities. So try to put as much color in your plate. And if you do that, you're going well along the pathway toward better health. And again, as we said earlier, the only decision to make is what to put in that other one third of the plate as protein. Your dietary philosophy will dictate that. Let's go to baked potato, because I, I, sometimes it's fun to have a little discussion. Dr. Dennis Burkett once published a study of giving people 10 potatoes a day, every day, and for three months they could eat other things, but there wasn't room for much of anything else, and they all lost weight. So is it possible that baked potatoes have less than 118 calories per potato that maybe for some people it may be okay, just as long as they don't put things on it that's causing them to be inflammatory? Possibly. Okay. Possibly, but unfortunately, the baked potato is not very rich in protein. So if you're eating only baked potatoes, <coughs> you're going to have a little problem maintaining muscle mass. Losing weight is a very slippery slope. I can lose water, I can lose uh, protein uh, for my muscles, and I can lose fat. Losing fat is a very slow. <laughs> very <process>. slow. <laughs> so again, you so, got to run, you got to work out, yeah, yeah, you got to eat more greens and, and yeah, vegetables. Just, just like your grandmother told you. So <laughs> again, we use weight or even fat loss, but we should be looking at the loss of inflammation or the increase in resolution. That should be our goal. So if you're looking at uh, this idea of inflammation, is there any published studies of people actually eating baked potatoes? Uh, is there some issue with the nightshade family? Some people have a problem. Maybe they're personally having a, a rejection or a compatibility yeah, so the, thing. The potatoes fall in that nightshade family, as do tomatoes, and of course the deadly nightshade itself. Eggplant. Uh, so, so for many people, not many, but a, a significant minority, they won't have allergic problems. So you basically find out what foods you uh, are allergic to, and basically just avoid them. 
So an IgG test, uh, a delayed food allergy test, some people refer to it as where they're measuring white blood cell activity. Is this one way to measure or it do you is, think of another test? I think the best way is basically just keep a careful food diary. Oh. <laughs> it works every time. Keep a food diary, but then something you eat might react a week later. Exactly. That's why a careful food diary. Okay. All right. And then in that regard, you could then measure the inflammatory markers of omegas. Right. And that test is available commercially for about how much uh, the, right now? The test will run from $75 to about $150. Would you want to repeat that test at periodic points? To oh, yeah, at least once a year. Okay. Why? Because you want to see how inflamed you are. If you took only one blood test in your entire life, that would be the test I'd recommend. Very good. Thank you very much. What website can we give out for you? Uh, I would go to zonediet.com. Perfect. Zonediet.com. Dr. Barry Sears. Thank you very much. Great job.